Kære takker. Ja, og kære venner, kære venner, dear friends, can you hear me all right? Good. Well, I'm, uh, I'm uh, delighted to see you all. I'm delighted that my colleagues and I could come up from the south. Most of today it looked as though we were going to be sitting alone in, in the south, but here we are in the wonderful north. And um, just to say, I've, uh, I've had plenty of time this weekend to ponder the happy relationship between Norway and Iceland. I've been at a place in the west of Iceland called Reykholt, and you probably all know that that is where Snorri Sturluson lived and indeed sadly died, and where he wrote the history of the Norwegian kings and, uh, and all his other works which provide us with so much knowledge about Norwegian history and most of what we know really about the Norse <laughs> mythology. Um, anyway, I called my talk uh, A Brief History of Climate in Iceland and um, I'm going to talk a little bit about this and a little bit about that really because it's a very broad topic. Um, but uh, I think one of the key issues here is that uh, because of its location, Iceland is very marginal for agriculture, at least it has been in the past. And uh, of course now, with uh, slightly warmer temperatures, uh, lots of interesting things are happening with ag agriculture. When I was at Reykholt, I was told that um, you know, now they're growing barley in the area and indeed other parts of Iceland. And, and rather tricky things, also a farmer who's managing to grow a wheat crop, but he can't afford to process it. Remember so, camera? Oh, so I should look it's here. there. I should look there. I'm sorry I can't look at you. <laughs> I remember you as well. So, and um, this picture is rather special because we're also remembering uh, Fritjof Nansen, of course, and this is a sketch he made on his first visit to the Arctic in um, 1881, and I'll say a little bit more about the background to that shortly. Well, um, I'm not going to say very much about this slide except just to uh, put it there to, to remind us about um, why Iceland's climate is so variable. It's bang there in the middle between um, uh, cold currents, warm currents, both in the sea and in the air, and that brown line you see is um, a typical sea ice limit um, uh, in, in um, you know, at, uh, I don't know why it says a mild summer, because it should really say a severe winter, but anyway, sorry about that. Um, but of course things are changing very much in the, in the present with a uh, lack of sea ice. Um, sea ice is so important for Iceland, or has been in the past, and indeed is today in that the lack of it will, you know, really change things in the north. But in the, in the past, it had tremendous impacts on, on the, um, uh, the agriculture as it was, which was basically a hay crop to feed the livestock. So all these difficulties, as you can see. There were some benefits, of course. Marine mammals were brought in on the ice and so on, and driftwood. Um, although I'm not talking about um, volcanic eruptions, I just thought I'd show this nice picture because, of course, it is so important for the climate of Iceland. And volcanic ash layers give us very helpful ways to, to date all manner of things in Iceland. <coughs> so a little bit about the context. Um, the history of Iceland, uh, dramatic landscape change, uh, tremendous loss of the native forest, uh, loss of the, the soil cover, and um, you know, a difficult history. Famines, diseases, volcanic eruptions, and all compounded with the impacts of sea ice and a changeable climate, and to some extent, a difficult uh, uh, economic and political situation. So just a little bit of uh, historical context. Of course, Iceland was settled from around 871, and uh, a lot of people came from Norway. We also know that a lot of the original female population came from the British Isles. Um, so, but then in 1262, Iceland becomes part 
of the Norwegian realm. And um, that was all very nice. But then things change, and in 1380, Iceland becomes part of the Union of Kalmar, and full independence is not reached again until 1944. And Iceland, and, uh, and these are the countries involved in this so-called Kalmar Union. Um, and Iceland, along with Norway, Greenland, and the Faroe Islands, eventually came to be ruled by the Danish Kingdom, as you all know, so, uh, again, a parallel between Iceland and Norway's history. So, to get back a little bit more to the main point of the talk, um, uh, what I work on a lot is historical records of climate change, and, and so that's what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm not, it's, um, it's historical documentary records, all these different kinds of um, written records that provide us with information about climate in the past. And I'll say a little bit, uh, obviously there's not time to talk about everything. I'm going to talk a little bit about some diaries and a little bit about some official records. So um, this field is known as historical climatology. Um, this is a very beautiful picture of a, uh, from uh, one of the Icelandic sagas. But I don't really use the, the, you know, the well-known sagas of Icelanders because they're not reliable historical works. They're essentially works of literature, and that, that makes me mention the importance of source analysis. Because when you're, you know, looking at historical records, you want to be sure that they're accurate and reliable, particularly if you're kind of trying to reconstruct the climate of the past. So um, there are many different kinds of historical records available, available for Iceland. We find them in libraries and archives. And when we're doing our source analysis, these are the questions that we have to ask. Where was it written? Where, what, why was it written? Who wrote it? When was it written? And so on. These are the important questions. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit, um, and I'm sorry I can't spell here. I will consider, that's what it's meant to say, two periods in Iceland's climate history, from the settlement to about 1600 and 1600 onwards. And obviously it's going to be a bit of a rush through time here. Um, so for the medieval sources, we have the so-called medieval annals, we have bishop sagas, the so-called Stuerlinger sagas, which were about a, a particular family, a um, lot of, uh, a sort of a collection of sagas and different geographical descriptions, and you probably know all about those, so we won't say any more, except um, now to say what, what kind of data were available. So from the early period, we really don't have very much. We've got these sporadic, non-contemporary accounts. Um, but from, um, from around 1145 onwards, uh, up to about 1430, we've got, we've got some different uh, sources which are rather interesting, and they're mainly contemporary. And I just thought I'd give you a couple of examples. Uh, and this is what we might call a work of geographical description. It's from a saga but it's describing um, Iceland, and it's interesting. It says there's plenty of ice both on the land and sea. On the sea are great quantities of drift ice which fill up the harbors and permanently frozen glaciers. And grain grows in a few places in the south, but only barley. So written maybe around 1350, so um, you know, perhaps a good description of the climate of the time, roughly. And we have other sources which suggest a lot of sea ice at that time. And uh, just because uh, I was thinking about Snoddy, I put in this little quotation, which isn't strictly about the climate, but um, when uh, the occurrence of a volcanic eruption, and um, poor Snorri lost a lot of his cattle at that time. Um, so a little summary here about what might have happened. Uh, uh, during the settlement period and after, there's some evidence that the climate was relatively mild during the time of the settlement of Iceland, but it's very complicated. And I think one thing it's important to remember is um, the fact that the settlers came to a pristine environment. So uh, this sort of rosy picture of looking at the past, as you often find in some of these early writings, it might, just not, it might be not just that the climate changed, but of course, their conditions changed with the erosion and so on and so forth. 
There are some descriptions of famine around these years, 995 and 1056 to 1058. But I often think that perhaps that we have those descriptions, not because there was a long period of difficult times, but perhaps that was unusual then. So it's a bit complicated. Um, by the 1180s, some contemporary sources suggest some rather cold years, and perhaps it was cold-ish around 1250, um, and then we have some years when sea ice was mentioned, and the end of the 13th century was definitely severe. Uh, the 14th century appears to be extremely variable, but now we've got much better coverage by the sources. Um, we know that the 1320s were definitely harsh with a lot of sea ice, Maybe the 1330s were mild, 1360s and 1370s were cold, and we're not quite sure about the 1380s. Um, this period around 1395 to 1430 does appear to have been relatively mild. And that now we have suddenly a problem, because between 1430 and 1560, there are very few contemporary historical sources. Um, so because of that, we don't know much about the climate of the time, and there are probably different reasons for that. Um, um, uh, epidemics that occurred, a lot of people died, and, and the first people to die practically were um, the people who were writing, who were the, the, the priests and so on, and they would go to succor the dying, so then they would um, get the, ep the disease, which may well have been the Black Death. Um, this is a very rudimentary little graph and it doesn't lay claim to be anything much in the way of statistics but it simply shows the accounts that we have. So um, we can say that the, the 1300s appear to be very variable but again it might be just that you know, we have a reasonable amount of sources at that time. Um, so from about 1600 onwards, we've got a lot more information and it's possible to actually construct some indices. And at the end of my talk, I'll show you uh, a sea ice record that I've put together. Okay, I see I have five minutes. So I'm going to go through this very fast and I'm gonna try and be good and keep to the time. If I'd had time, I would have told you about this incredibly interesting weather diary kept by a farmer and a son, um, a father and a son in this area. Um, and again, we, that's rather nice. And then I would have told you about these records from uh, <laughs> uh, that are an absolute gold mine of information um, that were kind of a, a good aspect of the fact that Iceland became part of the Danish kingdom because um, officials, sheriffs, for want of a better name, all over, the, all over Iceland in all the districts were required to send uh, reports talking about the conditions in the country. And so I would say just forget the words and enjoy the pictures in the background. Um, but um, here's a nice picture of Arkadedi because after, well, I should just say perhaps quickly that um, it was, you know, it's a bit complicated. Iceland was one kind of region called an umpt. And, um, and then later on it was divided into two, and then later into three. Um, and the umpt man, which is a word you'll know in Norwegian, as well as umpt in Icelandic, um, the district governor, um, the seat was moved to Arkadedi after a fire. And here you see all the different counties of Iceland, and so there would be a report from every single different county at least once a year, often um, three times a year. So, and the letters tell us a lot of information. So as I say, they're really a gold mine. Um, this is a, a rather nice photograph, I think, of uh, one of these letters, a rather fine example. And, um, and the, the columns describe the weather, the climb, the sea ice, and so on, um, trade, hay, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And um, here's one example. I had a, a few. The winter so far has been very severe. Um, earth covered with thick and hard crust of ice, impenetrable to the livestock. Um, so rather bad news. And that's from an area um, 
uh, near to to here, and this is from Mother of Edlid, just down down the coast here. So um, I've said that. Um, Variations in sea ice. Um, The decades with the most ice might have been the 1780s, early 1800s, 1830s. Um, The 1880s, I said I'd say a little bit about that. Um, because of um, the fact that this uh, was around the, the time that Fritjof Nansen first went to the Arctic. And again, we don't have time to go through these. Um, another account. A um, little bit about temperature variations. Um, the early decades of the 1700s seem to have been relatively mild in comparison with very cold 1690s, 1730s, 1740s, and 1750s. And, um, and then I had a look, quite a, a section here about the 1880s, which came to be called the dire years. Um, so another example. And then a little bit about um, effects. And again, I am the last person to be a sort of climate det- determinist. Um, one has to take into account many, many factors uh, regarding what was going on. And there was no doubt that Iceland had a rather difficult political situation and the economic situation also. But uh, farms would be deserted sometimes. And really, typically, we do see this happening during uh, difficult um, uh, times of rather difficult climate. And begging and crime sounds awfully serious, but, uh, you know, it was probably poor people who were hungry and so on, so it's a bit sad, so we'll go on. But, um, but then, of course, around, around the 1880s, um, emigration to the, um, uh, to the New World, and some rather nice photographs were taken uh, around that time. Um, this is a, a sea ice index that I've uh, put together based on... Um, the records I've mentioned, but also uh, a lot of other records that I haven't had uh, time to mention. And um, we can see some of these rather interesting years, um, 1695 when there was sea ice all around Iceland, um, 1782, 1888, um, and then uh, rather the so-called ice years around, around the period 1968. So just a little bit of a summary then. So famines and dearths, which were due in large measure to climate impacts, occurred many times during the history of Iceland, and sea ice played a very large part in this. And the pattern of climate impacts could be that there was lack of winter grazing, there was a freeze-thaw cycle, there might be poor grass growth, a too dry or more usually a rainy summer or harvest, and then you had cumulative impacts with the livestock dying and humans becoming malnourished, and so on. But things got better, and here we are, and the climate debate continues. Um, If I'd had time, uh, I would have liked to have talked a little bit about a very interesting debate that took place in the early 1900s between um, a Norwegian historian, an Iceland uh, Icelandic geographer, uh, a Swedish oceanographer, and indeed Fritjof Nansen. And the, the debate concern, concerned the climate of um, the medieval period, and they were particularly interested in what happened to the settlements in Greenland, where they wiped out because the climate changed. And, um, and some of those people said yes, but I think Fritjof Nansen was actually quite ahead of his time in this respect, in that um, he said, no, 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 it was, mu- it was actually much more complicated and, uh, you know, there were other things involved. So, anyway, good for him. Kaida thakir, tusen takk.